All right, everybody. Welcome back to Confessions of a Reformer. Mike Maishu here. Got a special guest with me. Um, doing a series on Christian nationalism, as you know, and uh, I wanted to bring in my friend April. Uh, you may recognize her from social media because she makes these hilarious skits, mostly, I think, critiquing and, dare I say, mocking evangelical culture, um, satire, sarcasm. I don't know. It's it's brilliant. It's comedic genius. Um, so you'll recognize her on social media as April Ajoy. April, you want to say hello and just let people know who you are? Yeah. Hello. Um, thank you for those, those kind words on my, the, the videos where I wear wigs and such. <laughs> um, I'm a, yeah, I'm April LaJoy and that's, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm on the interwebs. <laughs> totally. Nice. Great. So the reason I want April to jump in on this Christian nationalism conversation is she's got a story um she's got some history there which for the record um i was raised in christian nationalism before we knew to call it that um yep. so i'm just going to share my first embarrassing story and this is really the gist of my embarrassment i like what i can offer here um so just kind of like create a safe space for you april when <laughs> i was you. um a freshman in high school i took a class called what was it called um it was like glass cutting. I don't remember what the name of the class was, but we basically had cut glass and then like create mosaics and stuff. And one of the projects I worked on that took me like two months to make was an American flag. Of course. And then interspersed within the stripes was a cross. So there wow. was a an inverted cross amidst the, black, the white and red stripes of the American yeah. flag. Um, and that's still hanging in my mom's house to this day. Um, of course it is so did you title it by his red white and blue stripes we are healed <laughs> um i was not clever enough back then to pull off, <laughs> so there is no title for that piece um but it does haunt me in the hallway of my mom's house so anyway that's i'm bringing that to the table but um april to get us going what i'd like to do is first because i think you're probably going to be new to a lot of people in my world I would love to hear your origin story, um, where you came from, specifically as it pertains to the Christian nationalist conversation. Yeah. Um, I know you've got, I mean, so feel free to share any and all of whatever details you would like from there, but I would just love for you to just tell your story. Tell us who's April from the Christian nationalism world. Sure. Well, <clears throat> I have cringier uh, things than making an American flag with the cross mosaic. Um, maybe not cringier, but just more of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> so my background, I'm originally from Texas and my dad was an evangelist growing up. My grandfather was a pastor. Uh, he was ordained assemblies of God. So we were, you know, Pentecostal, but left the assemblies because we had this saying for all have sinned and fallen short of the assemblies of God. And so anyway, we were still Pentecostal. We were still basically the assemblies of God. Just, we went non denom. And so, um, so I was, my dad and my grandfather kind of co-pastored this church in Dallas, Texas in the, it was like in the eighties and nineties. And the, it was a large church had like 4,000 members, which for back then was a big deal. Cause that was before like mega churches were everywhere and they were on like Christian radio, Christian TV. So I, you know, was a preacher's kid and an evangelist kid. So I was homeschooled and my dad like my whole family would travel around the world and my dad would preach in all these different churches or, you know, crusades as they were called. And I would sing before my dad would preach. Um, actually I, don't, I have, uh, twin brothers and my mom and they all sang too. So we were like the partridge family at, at different moments. It was, we were a singing sensation. Wow. Um, yeah. So, and, and kind of like you had said, I, we wouldn't, we would not have called ourselves Christian nationalists, but we were, you know, like, <laughs> especially in hindsight. And, and I think most people who are Christian nationalists, even today would not say that they are, it's more, totally. you know, it's covert, but we can, we can get to that later. Um, so I guess like my Christian nationalist highlights would be when I was in high school, I made a MySpace group called I'm a Christian, therefore I'm Republican. So, um, and all of my youth group friends joined because they were good Christians, obviously. Oh um, I said that sarcastically. Okay, so, <laughs> tell. so, and 
my faith was intertwined with my political ideologies because I was kind of, um, you know, indoctrinated with both a fundamentalist conservative interpretation of scripture, as well as a fundamentalist conservative belief system politically, they just interconnected. So the next, the cringiest thing, the cringiest, um, when I was 18, uh, actually we'll back up a bit. When I was 16, uh, we went on a national caravan, my family, because my dad wrote a book called America Say Jesus. And so we went on this America Say Jesus caravan where we were in a 40 foot motorhome bus that had America Say Jesus and American flags like written all over it. And so we drove it from South Florida to Las Vegas, we went up and down the Las Vegas strip a few times, like trolling people, <laughs> uh, which is fun. Uh, it actually was kind of fun because <laughs> I felt like at the time I was like 16, just like wave. I had a My America Say Jesus t-shirt on. And my dad would like honk the horn and we'd just wave at everybody. And um, it's a very unique experience. <laughs> but then as part of that, when I was 18, I wrote a song that went along with it, also called America Say Jesus and sang it on the Jim Baker show. Now, for people who don't know who Jim Baker is, would you mind just giving a little intro on that? Yeah. So Jim Baker, was it in the 80s? I don't remember exactly when it was, but 70s or 80s built this kind of Christian empire. Um, he did. It was like a like a timeshare type, but for Christians for this like big vacation thing. And he was also really big on um, like Praise the Lord, uh, TBN. Um, big televangelist ends up there was a lot of money fraud tax fraud um because I think he oversold his timeshares by a lot and anyway it's a long story but he goes to prison <laughs> and then um while he's in prison he writes this book called I was wrong comes back out and you know his ministry is definitely not as big as it was but he still has the Jim Baker show that is still a national Christian television. He still, still raises money. <laughs> it's still on today. Dang. Okay. So hang on. Um, you're performing on the Jim Baker show. You're 18. Um, mm -hmm. What was it like being on that stage, releasing a song you wrote and just like such a, a platform and venue? Like, what was that like at 18? Um, I mean, it was pretty cool. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I mean, I was 18 and the, the clientele like audience is definitely older. So it wasn't like something that I bragged about to my friends, <laughs> if that makes sense. Right. Um, you know, and I didn't really know a lot about Jim Baker, about that the his past. Like I knew he had been arrested and been to prison. And I thought it was just this kind of like cool reconcile reconciliation story of like, mm. oh, God restored this man who, who had fallen and all this stuff. You know, I was I was 18, so I was still just going along with the with the flow, but I genuinely believed my, my song. Like I believed that Christians were persecuted. I, um, I was about to write that next year, a book that only ever was sold at like my dad's crusades. You cannot find it online. I have made sure this is an awful, <laughs> awful book. Um, but at 19, my, my brilliant self at that age, you know, who knew everything, um, wrote this book called a dying breed is there hope for my generation and uh basically just called out other christians my age for not caring enough for being too nice too politically correct and who had got sucked into quote unquote liberal brainwash wow um yeah it was very very bad so um yeah, I, at the time, my goal was I wanted to go into politics, you know, to change, you know, take America back for God politically mm. and um, wanted to do that through like journalism, eventually like be on Fox News and then run for office. So clearly that did not pan out. <laughs> That's not the direction that your life went. No. Wow. Fascinating. Okay. So listen again, just because I think a lot of people who are listening, you, you're new to them. Um, what happened? How did you end up <laughs> going from singing America Say Jesus? Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, on the Jim Baker show to where you are now, there's a story. And, you know, I think people also 
would love to hear where you are now, what that even means. Like, I, I, yeah. I'd love for you to have the opportunity to kind of share your story there. So yeah, whatever you'd, you're willing to share, I want to hear it. Sure. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's a long story, <laughs> but I can, I can give the cliff notes version when I was 23. So I had just graduated from undergrad. My dad got diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, but it was like non-smokers. So it was very rare. And uh, we obviously were Pentecostal. So I'm like, oh, cancer, Psh, we can just lay hands on this and God's going to heal it. Um, and so like for four months later, though, he died and was not healed despite us having like all the faith in the world. And I think I kind of saw, you know, being a PK, pastor's kid, preacher's kid, um, I saw a lot of hypocrisy behind the scenes my entire life, but it was just easier to just kind of put it to the side and think, oh, those are just those people are just crazy or, you know, those people are just, they're odd, odd ones out. Mm -hmm. And I saw just a lot of kind of an uglier side of Christianity when my dad had cancer. Cause one people that we hadn't heard from in years, um, suddenly were like showing up at the hospital unannounced, like wanting to lay hands on my dad. And it just, it felt like this competition over who could say the most powerful prayer, who was, who could get credit for my dad's healing. Um, it just felt really gross. So like then, predatory ministry, is that what you're describing? It definitely felt like that. <laughs> hmm. Um, wow. you know, and there was just a lot of judgment from people kind of like, oh, well, what could the, what could this family have done to deserve the, the, you know, the patriarch of the family getting cancer, wow. a lot of judgment. Um, and then when my dad died, of course, a lot of people were kind for like the first week and then disappeared. But, um, there were a lot of people that they blamed us for my dad's death, for God, not healing him. Like it couldn't have been God's fault. It wasn't God just didn't answer our prayer. It was, you know, we either didn't have enough faith or my dad was living outside God's will, or there was some kind of unresolved sin involved. And that just really like, I, cause I knew in my heart that I could not have believed for anything more than I did. And to, for people to just, you know, or the worst was, oh, well, God did heal your dad. He just healed him in heaven. I was like, that is not what I prayed for. Um, so there's just like a lot of gas, you know, gaslighting and it just felt really gross. And so I, I had, I could not go to like a Pentecostal, like a really charismatic service pretty much at all after that without just being infuriated. Totally. Um, I just want to chime in. Um, some of what you're describing sounds insane, right? Like what you're saying people did, how they responded. Like that sounds like, like I feel like some people watching or listening might be like, um, oh, that sounds like really bizarre and exceptional and like you're probably pulling some extreme cases. And I'm just going to chime in and say, no, that's par for the course. Like that's, yeah. I knew a lot of people. I spent 12 plus years of my life in the charismatic world. And that was what you described and those kinds of responses to especially extreme, ca extreme cases like that is unfortunately commonplace. You're not describing anything exceptional or bizarre or unique. Like that's pretty like standard for charismatic oh, yeah. zeal, you know? So for what it's worth, like, ah, uh, and by the way, I'm so sorry. It's like terrible. It's like, yeah. God. Yeah. Sorry. Carry I on. think, I think the reason, so I, I immediately started deconstructing, obviously the whole, uh, the word of faith kind of theology, like, you know, as long as you have enough faith, God will give you whatever you want. Like clearly that wasn't true. Um, but then it also had me, I recognized myself and a lot of what the, like a lot of the Christians were saying to me, cause it was things that I had said to other people before, you know, like it, whatever it takes yeah. to keep the faith intact. Yeah. You know, because it's, it's easy to say it about someone else, but yeah. you know, it happened to me. Yeah. And so I was like, oh shoot. Yeah. You know, it was just kind of this wake up call of realizing that I think this damn I've, I've caused this damage to other people. In the April, past. that's so real. I hate it. I am currently <laughs> actively still regularly getting to discover new ways of things that I'm critiquing and confronting, getting in the way of. And the irony of it is like, I did this four years ago. I was that guy six years ago. I said this to people, you know, like it's awful. Sorry. Anyway. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, so that was the first thing. So I guess the first thing that I deconstructed would have been, you know, Pentecostal healing stuff. Um, but I, I just kind of kept it in, I was like internalizing a lot of stuff and wasn't really being vocal about things. 
Um, cause if I said anything out loud, you know, it'd just be like, well, you know, God's ways are just above our own, you know, and everything, <laughs> everything happens for a reason. And, you know, look at all the good that's come from your dad dying. It's like, yeah, but I'd rather he just didn't though. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Ugh. that was one thing, but yeah. even with that, I was still very Republican, um, you know, and still very evangelical pretty much believed all the other things, but just like faith healing was one thing that was like, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm just not going to touch that. Yeah. And then the next really big thing was, um, uh, my brother, uh, I have two brothers and one of them came out to me as gay. And one so of the twins. one of the twins. Yeah. Okay. And you know, our, our household was very homophobic like i mean everyone was back then like the the whole church uh you know like homophobia was you know as as essential as john 316 you know (laughs) (laughs) i'm laughing to keep from crying i know so you know and what i had been taught about homosexuality was it's a choice it's you know it and you and someone would only choose it if they had a demon or under some kind of demonic influence So I immediately knew when my brother who I'd grown up with and who grew up in the same household and he's bawling to me saying like, he's known since middle school and has like cried himself to sleep mold, you know, so many nights begging God to take it away and to make him straight. (sighs) Like I knew instantly like, okay, it's not a choice. Um, because like I knew my brother Mm -hmm. and like, I know like the sucky thing about it is the things I changed on were just because it personally happened to me, you know, it's, and it sucks. Like if, if, if it hadn't happened to me, would I still be this fundamentalist person, you know, lacking empathy? And I, and I, I don't know, I wish it didn't take (laughs) personal experiences. Um, but uh, indoctrination, especially when you're indoctrinated from a baby, from childhood is like more powerful than I think people realize, especially when you are stuck in an echo chamber. It's, it can be hard to, you know, even hear an outside perspective or another way of looking at things. So when my brother came out, I was still not affirming, (laughs) you know, I was, I became more side B. And even when my brother came out, he was like, you know, which side B means that it's not, you know, not a sin to be gay. It's just a sin to act on it. Um, so he was like, I'm going to be celibate. And, you know, at the time it's like, okay, cool. Yeah. And I was the first person he had ever told and he was 26. Wow. So that, uh, that was just a big, you know, wake up call for me. Cause I had definitely said some very homophobic things, um, as you know, he grew up hearing that. Um, so I slowly started researching LGBTQ issues. Um, it took me longer than I wish I could say, um, to become affirming, but you know, that was another little tick in it. So when the, um, 2016 election comes along, I was still Republican. I voted for John Kasich in the Republican primary. So, you know, most Republicans at that point would have called me a rhino, you know, Republican in name only. So, but, you know, I still thought Republicans were were still the the most Christian way to go even then. Uh, And and then Trump. Trump was a huge eye-opener for me. Like, we all know the evangelicals that just threw themselves behind him and defended some of the worst thing, like racist things, misogynistic things. Um, There were Trump prophets that came on the scene that prophesied, called him God's chosen candidate. And, you know, at this point in in the primaries, I just said like, hey, can we like vote for anyone besides Trump and Ted Cruz? I didn't like Ted Cruz either. He was, there's something very slimy about him. Um, And the pushback that I got from people that I had grown up with, you know, like people that I had looked up to as Christian leaders, like in my dad's church, just lost their minds on me and um, started calling me like 
this, you know, I was being used of Satan. Satan had gotten to me. I was being liberal. I couldn't see what God's will was. Um, there were people that said like my late father would be disappointed in me for not supporting Trump. And I, I had never experienced that type of pushback ever, but especially from people that I considered like my own community. And it just felt very odd to me, especially when I took a step back and was like, this is over Trump, the dude from The Apprentice. So yeah, I, and I was like, are evangelicals just, are they dumb or is it a power move? Because I could not, it didn't make any sense to me. And it was like every day I, I just, I felt like I was living in a twilight zone because I listened when they said, you know, when they taught me the words of Jesus uh, or, you know, love your neighbor, turn the other cheek, love, love your enemies. And they were championing a bully and then becoming bullies themselves. And it was just very eye-opening for me. Yeah. Hi, Mike here. I just want to make sure you know that I'm a coach and a consultant. I specifically work with people through their queer journey or their religious baggage. And there's a link below this episode if you want to work with me. All right. Let's get back to the episode. And then while Trump was president, um, obviously my deconstruction accelerated and then 2020 happens. Um, and I was very, uh, we were still going to uh, church of God, evangelical church wow. all the way up till the pandemic. I was on the worship team. Um, you that know, it's fresh. Yeah. Like it's, wow. it is, it is fresh, but I found myself, you know, it's like, the year leading up to the pandemic, I, I was having a hard, like I started to feel like a hypocrite, mm. not because I didn't love Jesus, but because I saw what the Christians at my church would post during the week on Facebook. <laughs> and then we would show up to church together and worship this God. That's like, love your neighbor. And uh, like, it just, I found myself just being angry that I, that we could read the same red letters and we could read the same scripture. And we're coming away with two completely ideologies on just basic human decency. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I just, I would just leave angry sometimes in church. Cause I just, I just couldn't handle it. It was the hypocrisy was like, you could taste it. And I started, that was when I, I think the anger was also at myself. Cause I started to feel complicit mm, by, totally. by still going, you know, and, but I still had this church guilt of like, no good Christians go to church. <laughs> and so it was, it, I was just having internal conflict every day, um, over what I felt in my spirit was right. And then what all of the other Christians around me were actually telling me. So it was, are you reading my diary right now? This is really awkward. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. And then just seeing like, so I live in an area that went 77% for Trump in 2020. So churches around here were very much had the persecution complex of like devil's not going to shut us down. Um, and you know, like 10 people in one of the local churches died because COVID broke out there and no one wore masks or social distance. Like it was just unreal. Really? Wow. wow. So you obviously have such a entangled front row seat to Christian nationalism before we started naming it, right? I think in the last few years, we finally started getting language to start like identifying some of what people like you and me were raised in as normal yeah. our whole lives, right? Um, so can you speak a little bit more as we get kind of transition from backstory to now like the more topical aspect of Christian nationalism? Um, what in terms of like that specific critique, what started coming up more specifically for you when you started recognizing, oh, it's not just Christians, it's not just like, you know, like different interpretations of the Bible. There's actually something going on here that has a name and a pattern and a type of person that subscribes to it. Would you care to just kind of like unpack some of your perspective there? Yeah, sure. So I think um, I started realizing that people were equating their Christianity with how someone voted. And, you know, that's on a very basic level mm. of Christian nationalism. But then you started seeing, um, I mean, this is a, this is a huge topic. And I think yeah, right. one thing that I have started to realize is that Christian nationalism affects 
so many different avenues of the faith that people don't even realize. Like um, it's very much intertwined with the patriarchy. It's very much intertwined with white supremacy. Um, it's, you know, and Christian nationalism goes all the way back to the beginning of our country that, you know, people defended slavery in the name of God and Jim Crow and the, the you know, fought against the civil rights movement in the name of God. So mm-hmm. there's, you know, Bob Jones University didn't even allow interracial dating into, until 2001. So it's, it's, the roots go very, very deep. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I started noticing Christian nationalism with Trump. Um, basically when people started equating him as God's chosen, I can't tell you how many images I saw paintings with Jesus and Trump in the same picture. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the Trump prophets there when the week of the 2020 election, you know, it took the, a few days to uh, finalize all the, to get in all the votes and declare the winner during those few days, I saw, um, posts, so many posts of people saying just like Jesus was dead for three days, but eventually came out victorious. Like that's going to happen with Trump. Um, just a lot of things that would have been considered blasphemous if a Democrat had said it, you know, if anyone else would have said it, but since it was the group think part of the people that they wanted. And I think I realized too, that Christian nationalism is about a power grab. It's Mm -hmm. about, they use God to take power because God is easy to manipulate. It's easy to, um, especially when you're dealing with people who are already indoctrinated with in times theology that have God at the center of all these conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. So it's easy for, for people that want power to use Christian nationalism as the launching pad to take over. And it's a culture war. It's easy to get people riled up um, and think like, Oh, hurricane Katrina happened because of homosexuality. It's God's judgment. So you get all these people riled up, like, Oh, we've got to take America back for God. We've got to honor God. Or God's gonna, you know, cause more floodings, cause more hurricanes, and uh, you know, mass shootings. Like, you know, it's not a gun problem; it's a people problem. And mm. you know, it's just, it's, it's just easier to to get people to come along if there's if they think there's some holy war involved, something bigger than themselves. And also, there's a there's a desire to have the answer. Mm. And Christian nationalism and fundamentalist Christianity provides those answers. They're not right answers, but they're answers. It's a very black and white theology. It's good Mm. versus evil. It's black and white. It's easy to, you know, it's easy to explain things away. And it keeps people from accepting their own responsibility. Totally. Um, You know, same thing with climate change. Uh, People take all these extreme weather conditions as heading towards the end times and the rapture where God's going to give us all a new earth anyway. So we don't need to change how we as humans are behaving on the planet and take care of the planet because this is all part of God's plan, you know, cause it's scarier to think that we could be losing our planet. <laughs> totally. I mean, yeah, it's terrible. It's scary because all of a sudden now we have to do something about it. We're not just going to get right. rescued out of this. Right. Totally. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Okay, so um <laughs> I don't even I don't remember your original question, but I'm just yeah, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, the Christian nationalism um uh is basically a way to take control. And there's a lot of people that just really want the gold days. And it's also invested in purity culture because if they can keep women in line, then all they have to do is worry about controlling the men and men, you know, it's easier to control just a smaller group of people. Um, so it, it's just got its fingers and, in, in every aspect. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, I w- I actually was in a, Christian nationalists workshop class a few weeks ago and they clarified um 
I forget who the instructor was. I should know his name, but he clarified like, hey, when we when my team and I talk about this, we actually have to specify that we're talking about white Christian nationalism, mm -hmm. right? Like it's not just this objective, you know, idea. It's actually like act um, uniquely tied to a certain like type of person in our culture. And when this comes up and you look at, you know, a white person versus a person of color in relation to Christian nationalism, the stats actually change. And so the whole like privilege component comes into play and all that. Um, you'd mentioned earlier uh, Christian nationalism specifically having to do, you said it like what goes in a bunch of different directions. Um, can you speak a little bit to the white side of Christian nationalism as far as what you've come across? So I, yes. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, Christian nationalism was very much involved with um keeping the status quo with, with slavery. People used Bible verses to justify mm. slavery, um, ignored the verses about liberation and freedom. Um, so, and there's very much uh, whiteness is involved. And one of the biggest, you know, it, it, racism was another big wake up call for me, realizing how deep racism is rooted in the white evangelical church. And, you know, on, on a very like e example, of this is, you know, just like, you know, so many Christian nationalists don't know they're Christian nationalists, but perpetuate those ideals. M good. Most white people are racist, but don't know they're racist. Mm -hmm. um, and then an example of, especially in the church, you know, you're taught not to see color that, you know, it, it, there's just this disregard for, for, race and diversity like they want diversity they want they want to seem like they're diverse like churches they'll have people of color in their advertisements and stuff but it's still very much for the most part perpetuates whiteness and white supremacy i yeah. don't know if that answered your question that yeah just... no it does for, for <laughs> sure thank you oh well, yeah i just wanted your perspective and experience and that's yeah. exactly yeah uh you answered my question i would love to ask this as well and then i'm gonna have to land this plane which <laughs> it's so a much, big topic there's so much more to, yeah for sure so we're just getting a little bit of a, a sampling on it but um as far as like people listening right now who you know like are on their journey of becoming conscious of whatever r racism they might actually still have in themselves um i think a lot of people kind of like what you said about indoctrinated people don't know they're indoctrinated um a lot of people who are racist excuse me a lot of people who are racist don't want to know, I think that they're racist. They don't want to even look at that. They, it's just not possible, right? There are people who li are listening now who are probably racist and don't even catch that. Don't even hear this for themselves. Like, oh yeah, I, I love that they're saying this. This is great. Yes, confront racism, call this stuff out. Not actually realizing that they might even be complicit and you know participating um, as someone who's done work and like become conscious of this stuff in your own life in the way that you were like realizing what you were raised in and the values you were taught and whatever. Um, what are some helpful, if you have any um, tips on what it was like to have to become conscious yourself in like recognizing and taking responsibility for ways that you might have been in proximity to or complicit with or supporting of racist environments, ideas, etc. Do you know what I'm asking? Yeah, I think so. Like how... Oh how did I realize that in myself? Yeah. Like just be, kind of. <laughs> yeah, I'm not like asking you to admit you're racist, but like, <laughs> how did you recognize, Oh, whiteness is actually a part of this. Right. And obviously being a white person, it all of a sudden like makes it res like your responsibility yeah. to have to start becoming conscious of that yourself. Like, Oh, okay. Am I doing this? Am I part of right. that? Right. There's that kind of necessary part of that process. Right. Right. Um, I think there are a lot of people who probably just haven't had the opportunity to step into that yet um, right. or have, haven't taken it. And I'm just wondering if you have any like tips for what does it sure. look like to all of a sudden allow your whiteness to be called into like accountability and, you know, sure. take responsibility for some of that within yourself. Yeah. So I think the, the biggest thing that was eye opening for me is I think most people, including myself at one point, when I thought racist, I thought hate crime. I yeah. thought, you know, um, lynching, you mm -hmm. think of white hoods, you think of, you know, these things that the movies show is, is racist. What I didn't think about is, you know, clutching, you know, your purse a little tighter. If a person of color walks in the store or crossing the street, or, you know, like there's like microaggressions mm -hmm. that are on a covert level mm -hmm. that is racist. 
that's not a hate crime. It's just, I, and I think also realizing how ingrained racism and white supremacy is in the country, just the way that a lot of our history books tell about, you know, even slavery and um, Christopher Columbus even, and, you know, the history of how our country even came to be when it comes to indigenous people. Mm. They don't, I was not taught that our country caused mass genocide, you know, I was taught like, oh, they had a fun meal together and Christopher Columbus was this great man. And so like, I, I honestly think racism is just in the air here in America. And it's not, especially as a white person, it's hard to not grow up here and not be racist to some degree because it's, it's ingrained in us. And just, even in how, um, you know, media, it's getting a lot better now. But like growing up, how media would portray people of color, even the news and how headlines are written if if a crime is by a white person versus a black person or, um, you know, brown person. It's just obviously very different, but it's those subtleties that make one prejudice. Mm. And I think realizing like, you know, and I did realize a lot of these things in myself because I had to look in the mirror and ask myself, like, am I prejudiced? am I racist? You know, and, and it's a, no one wants to ask themselves that question. Like, I get it. Like, we, we want to love everybody. And, and I think, I think it's just this realization that you can do the work to be better, you know, and, and it's, it's not like I'm trying to think of how to say this because I don't know, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough conversation. Like no, even with Christian nationalism, like most people don't want to admit that they're Christian nationalists, but they're right. still perpetuating Christian nationalist ideals. Mm -hmm. Same thing with racism. You know, if you feel the need to say all lives matter, you are perpetuating racist ideals. Um, and that's, it's just, you just need to look at yourself in the mirror and be honest with yourself and how you view other people and with the ideologies that you are putting into the world and also know that you don't have to stay there that you can do the work when you know better you do better and like there's hope like and we can make the world a better place but you know that's part of it's just it's a it's hard to be self-aware to be that self-aware and that's something that I wrestled with feeling guilty for just the harm that I've caused you know being homophobic um right I, I've said all lives matter before <laughs> um things that I'm not proud of, but I talk about my past to show to one, to kind of help shine a light of like, these things are harmful, but you don't have to stay in that spot. Yeah. You know, like, like white guilt doesn't help anybody. It can help, it can help the individual to realize and wake up, but you don't want to stay in that place because you want to be able to help the situation and to be able to shine light and awareness on systemic issues in our country. And I don't have all of the answers by any means at all. If anything, I know way less than I used to, because, you know, I used to think I knew everything. Right. Um, but it's just being humble and being willing to hear other people, like listening to people of color and voices on the issue was, was really helpful for me and, and having to fight the urge to insert my voice because white people have a tendency to like our voices think our voice matters the most. It it does not. And in and, and those, and when it comes to topics of race, our voice really matters the least, doesn't really matter at all. Um, one book that was super eye-opening, specifically with racism in the church for me, that I recommend to everybody, if as like it's like a historical look at racism in white evangelical spaces, is The Color of Compromise by Jamar Tisby. Um, that he he also gives a lot of examples of of racism in the church that is just, it's, it's easy to see when it's spelled out, like he spells it out. Mm. Nice. Thank you. Cool. Really helpful. Um, I want to say this as a response, um, just thought that's coming up for me. It's not new, but I don't think I've said it like this before. So I just want to say it out loud just for the opportunity and then we're going to let this play. I think Part of the struggle for specifically white people, because like when the George Floyd thing happened in the middle of the pandemic and all that was going down, I was at Bethel when that happened and there was a lot, there was a lot to have to sort through and I had to go on a process myself to figure out what was I feeling inside and why was I responding to all this in a certain way. 
Um, so looking back, I can look back at some of that process and be like, yeah, I had to confront some racism in me. I wouldn't have called it racism. You know what I mean? Like I could defend or justify why I was processing through things, but a lot of what I was having to face was the convenience I had of ignoring all this altogether, not having to face any right in myself. And so I spent like literally seven days consuming as much content in various forms that I could to expose myself to whatever it was I was missing I was just very aware I'm I'm missing something people feel very strongly about something that I'm not connecting to what am I missing right and by the seventh day of this process something broke um I think the biggest hurdle for me in that process and I'm assuming it's probably true for most uh, white adults I'll say is the necessity to admit error like you have to admit you were wrong you are wrong about something not I was wrong. Like I am currently actively wrong about something right now. I have missed something and, or I've been part of something that's actually been really harmful for, you know, so admitting that I think in and of itself already is a huge barrier for people. And then not knowing the solution or the answer, right? Okay. So if this is true, what do I do now is a very vulnerable position to be putting yourself in. And I think the last time we were that used to being in that position was like, when we were kids and like learning new things, right? When we just don't know something. So I feel like admitting you're wrong and then not knowing what to do about it is just probably too powerless for people in a, their adult stage of life to be willing to be in that kind of a position to do this work. I'm just trying to process out like, what is the deal? What's hanging people up so much to keep them from being willing to admit and recognize and just simply do the work of clearing out the racism and toxicity they're just embodying, you know, without even realizing they're doing it. I just needed to say that out loud. Um, this is literally just like a verbal process for me, but anyway, yeah. I'm moving on from that. Um, but it does just kind of blow my mind. You know, when the Christian nationalist thing comes up, the racist thing inadvertently ends up having to be a thing too. And then you have to decide, do I even want to confront this right now? Am I just going to leave this alone? Like, is this person right. just not going to hear me? But it is a continued presence and the defensiveness and the, it's right. like, yeah, why is this still here? Sorry. Go ahead. You want to yeah, no, I, well, I think, I think it's human nature. For yeah. one, like no one wants to see themselves as the villain in right. the story. Uh, but also, I think, especially in evangelical Christian culture, uh, like you're just kind of everyone's a cookie cutter version of each other, and you want you mm. want your life together. Like it's this you put on this facade of yeah, God's blessing me, my, my life, you know. And even if you're going through something, it's because God's testing you mm. for something big. And um, there's just a lack of vulnerability in the church. Like, I don't know how many times I've heard a sermon where a pastor was like, got to get real with y'all tonight. And then tells a story about how he lost patience in traffic and said like, gosh, darn, you know, like that's not vulnerability. <laughs> like <laughs> I relate. So like when that's, when that's like someone sinning that you see in church, it's like, whoa, I, I can't be honest about my own problems and, and sin, you know? So it's just, there's a lot of comparison and this need to be the best Christian you can be. Totally. <laughs> cool. April, thanks for sharing your perspective and experience on all this. Obviously, there's so much work for us to do, and we've got such a strong cultural conflict we're actively having to confront today. <clears throat> yeah. So I'm glad to just like be having this conversation and exposing some things and hopefully stirring up, you know, critical thinking and responsiveness, you know, with everyone who's just like listening. Um, so April, what's the best way for people to get plugged into your world? I know we talked about a lot of serious, intense stuff. Um, a lot of your presence on the internet is, isn't necessarily this on the nose. There's so much <laughs> nuance and like humor in what you're putting out there. But um, yeah, how do people plug into stuff you're you're doing? How do they get more exposed to or plugged into your world and around you what's available out there sure so i am on instagram and tiktok at april a joy that's april like the month and then a j o y on twitter i'm at april a joy r because some inactive account has april a joy and i'm not bitter about it at all <laughs> um and uh that's where i like tweet at all the theo bros like quote tweet them it's fun i've got a new thing where i'm trying to quote tweet mark driscoll like once a week um <laughs> I haven't been blocked yet, but we'll see. Nice. Um, and then I also co-host a podcast called Evangelicalish, where we talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of American evangelicalism. And a lot of, we do a lot of current event stuff 
as well. And that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah. And if don't be surprised, I I often wear wigs and I have I have a Theo Bro character where I'm in drag. So that's kind of what I do. Humor is how I cope. So yeah. you know, I've got a lot of Christian nationalism and religious trauma, and so I make fun of it as my coping mechanism. It's my therapy. <laughs> it is also your service to the rest of us because we vicariously <laughs> get to cope with it with it through you. So we appreciate your service. <laughs> well, thank you. For sure. So I'll provide the links for that in the show notes so everyone can grab that there. Everyone, listen, thanks for listening. Thanks for chiming in. What? Thanks for engaging in this conversation. I hope that what's coming up in these dialogues is provoking thought and self-awareness and reflection and like a hopefully a responsiveness to confronting, you know, any of this stuff that's coming up in here in your own life and in, around you. April, thanks so much for being here. We appreciate, I appreciate your vulnerability and sincerity and yeah, just like the unique perspective you're bringing to something that's so prevalent around us. You've had such a front row seat to so much of this and thank you for being here for that. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. For sure. All right, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching. As always, the pertinent links from the episode are below. I also have coaching and consulting available for you, as well as facilitated groups you might be interested in. You can find information about any of that with the first link below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.